So today we are continuing our series in Revelations, but we actually start a new part. It's called Hard Hearts. Hard Hearts. You know anybody has got a hard heart? Some of you say that really quick. Like, yes, I do, in fact. And I'm sitting right beside them, hoping you're going to speak into their life. To know. <laughs> you got a neighbor has got a hard heart? You know that, that one down the street that you kind of told your kids, don't ever go near her house. And you think to yourself, what happened in her life that she's like that? You know anybody like that? You know anybody? And what's interesting about a hard heart is usually you get a hard heart because you were wounded somewhere along the way. And in order to keep from ever being hurt again, you put the shell around your heart to protect it. And you'll never let anybody get close. You'll never let anybody hurt you. You'll never let anybody... You can kind of finish how that went. Anybody? Anybody been there yourselves? A time or two? Yeah. Here's what's interesting is that uh, we can get a hard heart actually from God. Did you know that? Like your heart can become calcified. It can become a hard heart and actually it's like, hey God, I don't want you to be near me. I don't want you to be around me. I don't want to have anything to do with you. And, 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 and it's better if we just keep our distance and I'll pretend like, well, I believe there's a God, but I don't know if he really exists or I want anything to do with him. And the scripture says these are the types of people that we read about in Revelation. If you have your uh, e-vice, I want to invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 9. If you don't have a, a, a Bible app on your phone, we invite you to do uh, Life TV's Bible app. It's called the U version. You can Google it up and, and grab that or go into your app store. One of the interesting things about Revelation chapter 9, as we've been doing our study of Revelation, is that we have the promise that Jesus not only is going to come again, but there'll be a day of judgment. And we probably all have heard or uh, seen some kind of comedy show, usually, where some preacher's giving this hellfire brimstone damnation sermon, and they're talking about how we're all going to burn in hell unless we give our lives to Jesus. And, 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 and people are scared into a relationship with Jesus. And I just, I never think that's a healthy way to do it. Like, I just, I don't want anybody to ever be scared into a relationship with me. Like, I don't want to work with the kids at the high school and be like, you know, I'm the scariest person. You ought to be my friend. I, I don't think that's a good way to start a relationship with a spouse, by the way, teenagers in the back corner. If there's a guy that scares you, don't date him, ladies. Guys, if there's a girl that scares you, just stay away from her. Okay? Just, that's not a healthy way to do a relationship. But, but when we study this, we also need to recognize the fact that, there, that it is true. There is a day of judgment. And Jesus doesn't say this to scare us. In fact, the day of judgment, there is amazing patience shown by Jesus in the sense of that there'll be a day when God says, I'm going to come again to set the world straight. And all the injustices, all the wrongs that's happened, I'm going to set them straight. And I'm going to do a slow judgment with the intention that in the midst of this trial, in the midst of the, the, the judgments that are going on, people will, will look and say, you know what, God, we messed up. We return to you. We return to you. In my head, it was kind of fitting and interesting that on the, the Sunday that we would celebrate Veterans Day, that there was a message that had a glimpse of, do you remember... 9-11, there was this sudden resurgence in the church as people suddenly said, hey, a crisis happened. Maybe we should turn back to God. What we read about in chapter 9, though, is that there's a crisis and the people not only don't return back to God, but they actually turn away from God. We have uh, uh, the, the, the angels that are let out and there is this seal that's put on the foreheads of people and there's this terrible time of, of what we call tribulation meaning suffering and chaos and destruction that's going on and it's really God has basically said hey is this the way you want to live then I'll let you live that way here, here, go do whatever you want I'll back off if, if you don't want me I'm not going to force myself upon you which is the way God loves and cares for us if you don't want anything to do with me I'm not going to force myself upon you and he lets the world kind of go into its own chaos and disorder. And then we have these godly judgments where like one-third of the world is destroyed in the midst of what's going on. And what I want to do is I want to focus your attention all the way down to verse 20. All the way down to verse 20. Because we have these terrible disasters. And again, my thought was that you could go home and read about these and go, wow, that looks really scary and really difficult times. Yeah, uh, verse 20 is where I really want to sit. It says, the rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues. We, we have this conversation about plagues earlier on. 
still did not repent of the works of their hands. So the worst disaster you could imagine has befallen humankind, and it says that we still did not repent. Why? Because we have a hard heart. It says they still did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, wood, idols they cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murderous, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, and their thefts. Because of their hard, hard hearts. You see, what, what I find interesting is there'll be a day when it looks really bad, and instead of returning to Jesus, people actually walk away from Jesus. And what I want to do is I want to go, well, those dumb people... Right? I mean, geez, what has God got to do to get your attention? And then I pause and I walk by the mirror. You ever walk by the mirror and suddenly notice something on you you didn't see before? My wife keeps reminding me that when I walk by the mirror, I should notice that I have less hair than I used to. She says that because she says she loves me. I'm not sure how the two equate together. But I walk by the mirror and I, oh, look at that. I've got some peanut butter on my face. I did not notice that. Or, look at that. That little taco kid just slimed all over me. Either that or I've been mucosized all over my shoulder by myself or something. And that's what happens when you read Revelation 9. You walk by the mirror and suddenly you go, what if I have a hard heart? What if, what if just like in relationships that I have this way, what if when difficult times come, I, I, my heart gets hard with God? And instead of having a difficult time come and I return to God, what if I harden my heart and turn away from God? And so I was staring at the mirror thinking of that, and I, I thought, how do I, how do I keep from having a hard heart? How do I live so that, that as daily life adventures and difficulties come, I don't have a hard heart? And what I've done is I'm just going to give you four things that you can do to keep from having a hard heart. You ready? It's really simple. The first thing you can do to keep from having a heart, the very first thing you can do is get some rest. That's a great picture, isn't it? That's Nathan and I when we were little. I'm just kidding. I don't know who that is. How many of you would love some rest right now? How many of you are tired? Come on, hands up. Hands up, come on, Kelly, get that hand way up. All right. Yeah, well, man, I look around the room, most of us are tired. Here's what we know. Here, this is one of those things that you know, but you don't act on all the time, is that you know that you don't make good decisions when you're tired? There's all kinds of new studies coming out. Uh, Kelly Bush sent me this article from the Harvard Business School that talked about how when we, we are tired, we, we just make terrible decisions. How many of you have ever made a bad decision because you were tired? Yeah. Again, you already know this. That how many of you have, have hurt somebody because you said something you shouldn't have because you were too tired not to say it? Right? And, and as a parent, Lord have mercy. Right? We got the little boy, he's 19 months now, he's called the taco. Some of you have heard rumors how he works for Al-Qaeda. This child's had a cold for the past century, I think. It may only be the past week, but it feels like a century. And so most of the night, I'm up with him. And one night, I actually got doused because of all the, the stuff in his lungs and kind of came on out. And, and uh, I said to Allie last night, I said, Sweet Jesus, something needs to happen or I'm going to hurt him. And I love this child but I need some sleep. You ever been there as a parent? I always think there should be an award for parents some days. Like you get an award because your kids survived you. Right? I mean, just, hey, I get an award today. I let my child live. Right? We're just not good parents when we're tired. And we're not good friends when we're tired. And often the people that we abuse the most are the people that we should love the most because they're the ones closest to us because in our head they have to love us anyways no matter how bad we act. The number one way to keep from getting a hard heart is just get some sleep. Just get some sleep. Just get some sleep. Because when we're tired, 
Our lives become edgy. They become jaded. And the first thing to go when you're tired is what? Your patience. Whew. And soft hearts have lots of patience. So lots of patience. They're soft, not hard. So number one thing you can do to be a better parent, to keep a soft heart with your kids, get some rest. Number one thing you can do to be a better spouse, get some rest. Number one thing you can do to be a better friend, get some rest. Number one thing you can do to be a better girlfriend, boyfriend, get some rest. Number one thing you can do to make better decisions, get some rest. Number one thing you can do to help out your relationship with God is... Now, this shouldn't be a shock to you because guess what? He has this list called the Ten Commandments. I know we often read it as the Ten Suggestions. But he has this list called the Ten Commandments, and one of them is Sabbath. God literally says, look, I want you to take one day a week and just don't work. Get rest. Enjoy it. Relax. Have fun. Do something you wouldn't normally do and just go, wow, God, you're in charge. This is why this is so important because you know what Sabbath forces us to do? When we stop working and we stop doing all that stuff, it forces us to pause and remember, you know what? I'm not in charge of my success. God is. And, and I'm not going to get any of that done and it's still going to be okay because life isn't dependent upon me. It's dependent upon God. You see, by getting rest, you're actually saying to God, I trust that it's going to be okay even when I sleep. And I trust that when I sleep, you don't sleep. Scripture says God never sleeps. Scripture says that we should, though. And yet we all want to be like God and never sleep because we've got so much to do. How many of you know it'll be there tomorrow? And yet you've got to get it done today, Right? And then you go to bed guilty when you don't get it done. You see, lack of sleep messes up our priorities. Instead of keeping God a priority, we put ourselves a priority, thinking that we're really serving everybody else. But unrested parents are not good parents. Unrested friends are not good friends. Unrested children of God are not children who are trusting in the Father to say you're going to take care of it it doesn't rely upon me amen Whew. honest to goodness when I got done right now I thought we should just go home right there right do you kind of feel that way like okay that was probably enough for me I'm good uh, anything after this is going to be details I don't need to hear all right all right number two I'm going to give them to you anyways though because there's four number two stay in the scripture stay in the scripture read your bible Read the Bible. We have a book at our house. It's called Daddy Promises. I read this to the kids every couple months. I don't think they figured out I'm on a rotation with it yet. But it's just this book about the promises that this daddy makes to his young children. And he promises that he's going to play ball with them. And he promises that he's going he's to rock them in the, in, in the rocking chair when they're sick. And he's going to be there for this. He's going to see them all the way through graduation. There's one of the promises that it says, Daddy's going to listen to you. And, and it basically he says, look, I understand that there, you will tell me things that you see with your way down there eyes that I miss with my way up here eyes. One of the things the scripture says that it does is it transforms our lives. It helps us see the world through God's eyes, not our own eyes. It forces us to think bigger. It forces us to think different. It forces us to become soft-hearted people. You know why? Because the well, minute I want to get a hard heart, the minute I want to go, you know what, you offended me, I'm about ready to come over there and take your ears off and take your nose and put it on the back of your head and make you look like Mr. Potato Head. Anybody ever feel like that? Thank you, Dave. The rest of you are not as violent as we are, but I love you anyways. You see, the minute I start to get those feelings, I start to hear the voice of God in the back of my head saying stuff like, hey, remember 1 Corinthians 13? And I get upset with God when he does that. Did God ever do that to you? Because 1 Corinthians 13, we all read it and it's nice and pretty at weddings, but the truth is it's one of the worst the scriptures ever, right? Because I want to justify myself in my anger and then 1 Corinthians 13, it says stuff like, love never gives up. And love always forgives. Oh! I don't want to forgive him. Love always forgives. I don't want to forgive him. I want a hard heart. No, love always forgives. 
that keeps no record of wrong. Love is patient. Oh, I don't want to be patient. I want it now. No, love is patient. See, the scripture keeps calling me to soften my heart to be something else, to be something else. But God, that's like the twelfth time they've said no and they backed out on me and I just want to go over there and I want to paint on their door. Can't you keep track of your commitments? They weren't here again, God. Breaking my heart. And God says, that's okay. Because if you have a soft heart, it will get broken. But it's not your job to fix it. It's God's job to fix it. And the reason we crawl in the scripture is because we read over and over again about these heroes who were just like you and me who let God heal their hearts, and yet they remained soft-hearted before God. Or we have the other stories of people who were hard-hearted, and we see how their lives ended up, and we go, man, I don't want to be like that. I want to be in the Scripture with God constantly challenging me to have a soft heart, to be something more. Number three way to have a soft heart. That's a hard one. Manage anger, stress, and the hardships. Do you manage your stress well? Do you manage your frustrations well? I was so excited last week when we introduced uh, the fact that Marsha Bridges is coming on board and she's going to be our counselor and that she's got hours and uh, several of you have already picked up packets to be with her. And, and we had one mother share that she was so excited because this was kind of an answer to prayer that she was going to be able to start counseling and she just couldn't afford it. And we talked about, hey, this is, this is as close to free as you're going to get with these sliding, sliding rates. And, 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 and just we were so excited about that. And, and basically, at the end of the day, because we don't manage stress well, we've got to find ways to process that. And for some of us, that means we need to see counselors. For some of us, that means we need to spend more time in the gym. For some of us, that means we need to spend more time with healthy friends. For some of us, that means we need to spend less time at work. For some of us, that means we need to go back and see rule number one and get more sleep. How are you handling your stress right now? You see, when we get stressed, we get tense, and there's all kinds of, of psychological and physiological changes that happen in our body, and we literally get a hard heart. We need to learn to manage life a little better. Because here's what we know. Life's tough, isn't it? I mean, it's not always tough, but there are tough moments, right? And there's going to be difficult moments ahead. And so we've got to learn how do we handle those so that our heart doesn't become calcified. So that when my child or my friend or that teenager comes and says to me, this is what's going on. Oh, I just, I broke up with him. I don't turn and go, well, tough, suck it up, move on. Life's tough. Like, I've felt that way a couple times, right? And I think to myself, hard heart. And I can respond, man, that's terrible. Let's talk it out. Right? Let's talk it out. Soft heart. Learn to manage your own life so that you can present your soft heart to somebody else. How many of you need help dealing with stress? Okay, I just, uh, let's be honest for a second. If you don't have your hand up, you're lying and going to hell. Okay, just we need, just need to be honest, okay? Because all of us need help, right? Because life's stressful at times, right? Number four. Number four way to keep a soft heart. Number four way to keep a soft heart is to be in a regular godly community. I can't express to you how important this is. Now, just to be with a group of friends who are constantly challenging you, or constantly pulling you, or constantly loving you, with a group of friends that you could call up and say, hey, I had a crisis this week, car broke down, this broke down, I, I, I hate to ask, and I, I'm ashamed to ask, but can, does anybody have any, any money they can give me, or can anybody watch my kids this day, I, I'm in a crisis, can, can anybody help out here, and, and you feel like, you know what, there's a group of family of eight to ten people who just, yeah, whatever, I got you, whatever you need. A group of people who will sit beside you and go, we're here to cry with you through this. We know that you and your dad were really close and 
We're here to be with you through that or through that divorce. We're, we're going to stand beside you. We want you to know the church won't turn its back on you. We're going to love you through it all. We're going to love you and your kids through it all. You see, a community of godly believers who surround you there and don't say words that encourage a hard heart. And you know there's a difference, right? You've been with the other, other group of people, right? I've been there. Like, you're, you're walking through that divorce, and I've seen people say, well, the old blonde chain didn't deserve you anyways. The old hag, the old bum, right? And all they're encouraging you to do is get your heart hardened. Whereas a godly group of friends, they're not going to put down the other person as much as they're going to say, look, what is God? What is God saying in that? We're just going to be here and cry with you. And we're sorry that this isn't working out the way God wanted it to or the way you wanted it to. But we're here with you now. I'm going to give you a hint. We're putting together some special groups that are going to make that happen this, this spring. And if right now you're going, man, I want that group more than anything else, then you need to talk to me. Because you can help us put those groups together. But if you're needing that now, I want you to talk to me after the service. Let's go over them again, just so you got them. They're not too complicated. This is one of those sermons where we walk away going, okay, that was pretty simple. I got that. Now it's really hard to apply. Number one thing you can do to keep from getting a hard heart is get some sleep, right? So when you run into your grouchy neighbor next week down the street, you might want to say to her, hey, when was the last time you had a nap? In fact, some of you might say that to somebody real close to you this afternoon. Just just tell them that was from Aaron. All right? Number two. Number two. Are you reading the Word? Are you listening to the Word? Are you in the Word? Number three. Are you managing your anger and stress? And again, if you need help, go get help. I need help. I get lots of help. I have counselors and mentors that I see on a regular basis because I just think life's difficult. And I'm not smart enough to always go, what am I doing? Number four, be with a group of godly friends and community. We're going to love you through difficult times, into good times, and hold you accountable. Keeping your heart soft. Okay, so there's four areas. My challenge to you this week is which one of these do you need to work on the most? Okay, if you said, I need to get some rest... Here's the secret. Don't say, I need to get some rest, and don't change your schedule at all. Because if you were already getting the rest, okay, you wouldn't need to say, I need to get rest. And therefore, your schedule needs to change. Does that make sense? you you got a scheduling problem. So you need to find a way to schedule some rest. Put it in your calendar. Even if you don't sleep, just the fact that some of you chilled out on the couch. For some of you, that means you need to go back to rule number four, get that godly community and say, I need you to watch these kids for an hour so that I can just do nothing and not feel guilty about doing nothing because you say, what? But the pastor said I need some sleep. I blame him. And your friends will go, boy, maybe I should go to that church. (laughs) If it's rule number two, Stop waiting till 10.30 at night after you've watched the late early show. I'm not up late enough to watch the late, late one. I have to watch the late early show. So try to get to your Bible. Yeah, put that in your schedule sometime. My wife started doing it in the car. Now she's got a new job. It's great. She's got it in her schedule. She just throws on the app and listens to it. If it's, if it's, if it's I need to manage my stress and anger better, hey, get, some, get some counseling. We got one on staff now. It's really cheap, but it's good. Get with a group of friends and say, I just need to talk with you about this situation. I need to do something other than post it on Facebook because I'm not saying very smart stuff there. I keep having to apologize to people every time I tweet something. And if it's number four, the community place, you're at the right place. It's just time to engage at another level. So again, which one of these are you going to work on this week? Do you know? You got it figured out already? Guess what? Guess what? If you're sitting beside someone that you're close to and you can't figure it out, ask them in a very loving way and say, please be honest with me. They already know. Okay, they're not sitting there going, huh, I wonder what she should. They're sitting there thinking, I already know. Would would you please ask me? Let's go ahead. I've been wanting to tell you this for weeks now. Let's not leave them here. 
Let's not be like the people in Revelation 9 who have hard hearts no matter what miracles or signs God showed them. Let's be a group of people who have soft hearts so that we can be Jesus to the world. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we ask for your blessing as we come before you. As people who are in danger of having hard hearts, we just ask that you help us continue to have a soft heart and that you soften our heart, that you bring healing to places that we have thought would never be healed, that you bring transformation to our lives, that you change our mindset to focus on you, the living, holy God, the God of the soft hearts. Help us be better parents, better children, better teenagers. Help us to be better friends. Help us to be better children of you, the holy living God. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. If you're a guest or a visitor with us, uh, we want to invite you to pull out one of these cards on your way out the door. and I'll trade you that for some free ice cream. That's the way we do it. It's our unashamed bribe to get your information. God's blessing upon you. May you go find some rest. May you go create new schedule patterns for your life. May your heart be softened for the work that God's called you to. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are blessed. Amen.